everyone, this is the chapter on values, ethics, and advocacy. Once again, remember to complete this tutorial prior to coming to class. Also take a look at all of the key terms and make sure you understand what they mean and how to pronounce them. If you don't know how to pronounce them, please look them up in Course Point under Stedman's Dictionary. Here are the learning objectives for this chapter. Please take a moment to read through them. Uh, values are beliefs um, about the worth of something, about what it matters in the world, and that acts as a, uh, as a standard to guide one's behavior, right? And then we have values, um, and that are, we rank them in order of their importance, right? So obvious, obviously our value system leads to how we act personally and how we conduct ourselves in society, right? And then our influence beliefs um, we have, you know, beliefs about human needs, health, illness, you know, how we practice health behaviors, how we perceive human responses to illnesses. This affects all of our beliefs, right, about health and wellness, and um, and it can impact your um, care of your patients. So you just need to be aware of those, right? When I say values, what does that mean to you? It might mean something a little bit different to everyone, right? In a general definition, a value is a belief about the worth of something, about what matters to you that help guides your beliefs and your behaviors towards something. Values are usually formed over a lifetime um, and definitely has influence, right, from your family, your culture, your environment, your friends, and things like that, right? They, they impact your value. Through modeling, we observe and learn what is important to people um, who are important in our lives. And this tends to take um, after that, right? So that's where we form all our values from. Moralization happens when children are taught a value system through an organization like school or even church. Laissez-faire is the approach where the parents leave their children to explore values on their own and to develop their own personal system. This approach, however, can be confusing for children. Rewards and punishment also makes an impression on what is considered right and what is considered wrong. In the responsible choice method, there is encouragement to explore uh, values and their consequences. But this method also provides some support and guidance to help them develop their own personal value system, right? So that's a good way. There are some values a professional nurse must embrace to help them throughout their career. <clears throat> Pause and take a moment to read through these and jot down some notes on their meaning. Professional nurses never assume that their personal values are more correct or more important than the patient's values. We have to be non-judgmental um, and we have to really be value neutral, right? We always have to celebrate um, that we also have to maintain integrity, right? So uh, when I say celebrate integrity, like you need to live that. You need to be proud of that. You need to celebrate the fact that we um, have the highest integrity, right? Um, and that means that we're acting according to the standards of our profession and promoting health and wellness at the best that we can when it comes to social justice, right? This is something that we have been struggling with in this country since the 1600s. Please take time to read a news article or a nursing journal about the disparities that are still out there with the social determinants of health. You know, so I know we say we strive to, to uh, not have disparities in this country, but man, are we really struggling at this and we really need to uh, focus on this lack of uh, neutrality and this lack of resources to everybody equally. It's just, it's heartbreaking. Um, we know that society does not treat all people the same. Um, and in some instances, there are significant barriers because of what is going on in the area. Um, but we all have to make sure that everyone has equal access and that we're giving everybody the access to the care that they need, right? And that we're treating everybody this equally. Um, respectfully. <clears throat> when someone decides to value something, they choose it freely over all the other alternatives that exist, right? Prizing a value involves pride and happiness regarding that value, right? Acting 
um, is displaying the value you treasure through your actions, words, or behaviors, right? So how you act because you're proud of that value, right? So take a look at the clinical application of values in your textbook and see how you can get patients and family members to rank their values for clarification and self-awareness. This will also help guide our, our uh, nursing plan of care, right? So why is it important that you study ethics in nursing, right? First of all, you will encounter many ethical problems frequently in healthcare. And it supports that nursing is not only a profession, but also a, uh, a, a product of art, right? We've always said that nursing is part art and part science, right? You also need to be accountable and be able to defend the ethical decisions you make. Nursing deals with the whole person, unlike medicine, which deals with the disease process, right? So nursing is dealing with the whole person. We have to support our patients in their decisions. And as a nurse, you will be your patient's advocate every single day, numerous times throughout that day. You have the medical knowledge your, your patients do not possess, and you often must speak up or take actions based on your patient's beliefs and their goals, right? Um, and so just remember, advocacy is a huge proponent of it, right? And that takes, you know, having the courage to speak up to doctors and specialists and other um, healthcare professionals when it goes against what's their plan of care. But that is what we do day in and day out. So you got to not be afraid to to have your voice heard. Lastly, like other subjects um, studying ethics, um, will help you make better decisions by being able to analyze moral problems while understanding that all perspectives, you know, all of the different perspectives of that problem. So morals are private personal standards that you have developed from your personal experiences. And it may even, um, you know, come from possible religious beliefs as well. Morals are what you think um, in general is either right or wrong. Ethics is a bit different. Ethics uses specific rules or principles to look into the justification of an individual's actions or situations. So ethics is intertwined with the legal system and reflects societal values. Um, and then we look at bioethics is the application of ethics principles in healthcare. So again, bioethics is the application of ethical principles in healthcare. So nursing ethics is a subsidiary um, subsidiary of bioethics. As a nurse, you must be prepared to choose the extent of your participation in each healthcare situation, how you can support your patients making ethical decisions, and how you will cope with the result um, of those decisions made by others. Remember that your patients are scared sometimes, and maybe every communication, encounter, or experience, um, you know, they're nervous or scared about, so must be done so that we show the patient that they can trust us, right? Establishing trust is key to a successful patient-nurse relationship, so it shows them that we support them through whatever it is that they're going through, right, and that they can lean on us, um, and, and they need someone to lean on. This is crucially important as well when you look at the Gallup poll surveys because nursing has been the most trusted profession by society for over 20 years now. And we have, even through COVID, you guys, and we have a big responsibility out there to make sure that we are acting in the best interests of our patients and society, not just what's convenient for us. And that supports the concept of ethical conduct. And what I am doing as a nurse to show that again, I am keeping the trust of my patients and my population that I have acting as a person in support of their goals of care, not my individual plan of care, but their goals of care, right? Action guiding theories fall into two categories. We have utilitarianism and then we have deontological. Utilitarian looks at the consequences of the decision, while as deontological looks at following the rules over the consequences, right? It's important to decipher between those two. Feminist ethics critiques existing patterns of oppression and dominating in a society especially affecting women and the poor right so we see um feminist ethics saying you know that um there's oppression from society with women and the poor and the under deserved under um served right okay the principal approach to bioethics has four key principles with um an additional two nurse nursing we have added two additional to uh, the bioethics. 
they include those listed on this slide. And um, all of these are important. Also, your book has some examples if you'd like to look further into that. Again, all of these are important principles to help uphold in nursing. And you should know them for your exams. It's going to be on your exams in block one, HESI, your final, your, you know, throughout the other blocks and in, in NCLEX licensure exam as well. Um, I'm going to be asking you in class, so tell me what would account to be accountability look like to you? right? What would responsibility look like to you? What would dependability look like to you? How about safety? What about legal ethics? What does that look like, right? We're going to be asking you things because they are important for you to be able to define um, and to utilize in our profession, right? And to use as guiding principles. And again, most of the exam questions will be with patient examples um, or it could be nursing theory examples too, right? So, but it's going to be an example. It's not going to be a definition when, when we have the critical thinking and clinical reasoning, right? To get your, your brain to critically think. Uh, exam questions will be critical thinking, right? So patient examples, and we'll practice that a million times in class too. Let's face it, we know in the last couple of years there's been lots of misinformation out there about healthcare and a lot of disinformation out there um, on the internet, right? It's, it's there today, so you got to be real careful when you use the internet as a resource. Matter of fact, let me just pull my, uh, my soapbox out now and say don't use the internet uh, unless you're using a valid source, right? But just Googling a topic... Um, is not the right thing to do because there's so much erroneous information out there. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of great information too, but you gotta be competent enough to do the right type of searches. And when I say competent, I don't mean like smart, I just mean educated, right? How do I do a search to make sure I'm getting the right evidence-based practice information and not simply someone's opinion or an old wife's tale or all that jazz, right? So again, you have to make sure that the information you have is correct, even if it doesn't go by your personal belief system, right? And that will occur in your career, I promise you. You're going to have to be okay with this. Um, as it, it, with modern science, is the most accurate at the most time, okay? Period. There's going to be times you're going to need to go f with it, okay? And you're going to have to be okay with that as you work through your own ethical issues as well, right? There are some other ethical issues as well that we have to be careful of, and that's paternalism. You can't act like a parent to your patients or act like you know what's better for them um, than they know, right? Again, it's all about them. It's not about us. Don't be paternalistic with your patients, right? It's not going to work, especially when you're working with older adults. It's just going to tick them off. Um, you're not going to tell them no. You can't have that cup of coffee after your dinner time. So for example, right, that's a great example, right? A lot of, a lot of elderly patients, you know, want to have a cup of coffee after dinner time and then, you know, it keeps them up at night because there's caffeine in it, right? You're not going to tell them no because you're their parent and they can't have it. But what you're going to do is you're going to say, uh, you're going to do education. You're going to say, look, uh, let me just explain a few things to you. If you have that cup of coffee, one, it has caffeine in it, it's going to keep you up at night too. It's also going to increase your need to urinate more frequently, which is also going to keep you up at night. And then you go down the list, right? And so, but then they ultimately get to decide for themselves that they say, yeah, all that being said, I still want the cup of coffee. Then you give them the cup of coffee, right? Um, you educate them about the repercussions, but the decision is ultimately theirs to make. Um, all right. Because remember, caffeine's a diuretic, so it definitely is going to make them get up at night and urinate, um, interrupting their sleep. So just give them the decision, and ultimately it's theirs. You cannot lie to your patients either. You have to be truthful all the time. So it's okay to say to a patient, you know what, I don't know the answer to that. Um, let me find out. That's the next important piece, right? Um, so... I personally dislike blogs that a lot of hospitals are calling Caring Bridge, where patients can write their own blog and people can read the blog and comment on the blog. I dislike them because people use that as a way to get medical information, and many times that information is completely false. There's absolutely no science behind it whatsoever. And then these patients who go there are altering their medical care based on that, right? It's just entirely terrifying to me. Um, patients may refuse something that you think, oh my Lord, why are they refusing that, right? So um, 
Another example might be in the world of oncology, patients have um, to sign a consent saying they agree to receive chemotherapy agents, right? So again, chemotherapy agents are, uh, it's a, a solution that kills off all of your um, white cells, right? And gives your body an opportunity to reproduce healthy cells. So it's killing off the cancerous cells, but it's also killing off the healthy cells. So patients have to hear all of the side effects potentially of chemotherapy agents, right? So we don't have our, our immune system uh, is compromised, right? So, um, so again, people will say, oh, I would never ever take chemo if I ever had a cancer diagnosis. Well, that's your belief system and that's okay. But others may want it, right? So you cannot push your beliefs off on them. They may feel that that's what they want. And, um, and if you were to give them your opinion, they may refuse chemo treatment that could potentially save their lives, right? It's their choice. Do not put your opinion there, even if they ask you for it, all right? It's unethical. Don't do it. Uh, for something that be, that might be survivable or something that we can at least get that disease under control, um, and you would say we have great therapies, we have great treatment, it can extend your life for at least another decade, and it's a good quality of life, and a patient might say, yeah, but I don't want to go through that, and I'm okay with the fact that I've lived a good life and I'm ready to die, and you have to be okay with that. Again, it's their decision if they opt not to get the chemotherapy, right, and they just want to whatever their belief is, move on to heaven or whatever that looks like, right? Or get reincarnated and start their life over, whatever that looks like, their belief system, they, they have that choice. And we may say, oh my God, you could, this is so curable. All you have to do is, you know, chemo and a little bit of radiation, but guess what? It's not our decision. We educate them on the possible outcomes and, and the, you know, the side effects and then let them make the decision. Then an ethic, ethics committee will be convened if it ever comes down to say, um, like for example, a family wants to do one thing to the patient and the medical staff feel like they're doing it to the detriment and to the patient, right? And they're only doing it for their personal reasons, right? So they can get that inheritance or whatever that looks like. We will convene an ethics, an ethics committee, okay? And it's usually done virtually, right? And at this committee, individuals can bring up their concerns about what is going on, and then everybody as a group will discuss this issue at hand. And they'll look at the information with uh, the analysis piece, they'll gather data, they'll analyze it, they'll go through all the different informations, the surrounding issues, they'll have great discussions, and then they'll come up with a resolution and how to proceed, right? And then once the ethics committee does that, everybody will need to do, uh, will need to carry that forward with the knowledge that we are now uh, going to um, do the best possible plan of care for this patient, right? Ethic committees also help create policy. Um, they also review cases where there where things went uh, wrong. Um, they do research. They look at quality improvement measures. They're a great, great asset to healthcare settings, right? And remember, it's all about the patient. And if you're having an issue where something is truly grating against what your personal belief system is, you need to take a step back and think, okay, I wouldn't do this for me personally, but I'm going to do it for my patient. This is what they want. They've been educated about all the positives and negatives and um, I'm here to provide the best care of my patient and it's what they truly want right that's the true definition of practicing ethically right you may not agree with it but you know it's in the best <clears throat> interest of your patient because that's what they want so please remember that forever Hair-based approach pays attention to the specific situation of our individual patients viewed from their side or circumstance. The characteristics of this approach is listed on this slide. Please pause, take a moment and read through these. Nurses must conduct themselves ethically while providing patient care. In order to do so, you need to know and study ethical theorists, learning the virtues of nursing and get familiar with nursing code ethics, right? So here they are, nursing virtues, right? So pause this and read through them. You must uh, be able to display all of these.
This next slide reviews why we have code of ethics in nursing, right? Code of ethics are principles that reflect the primary goals, the primary values, and the primary obligations of a professional nurse. It outlines our ethical obligation and duties to our patients. It is non-negotiable, and it is our own understanding of our commitment to society. Did you know that for many years in a row that nursing has been voted the most ethical profession to be in? I know, I told you, right? It is. It is um, It is an honor, right, to live in the most valued profession, right? Um, well, I told you it was the most trusted profession before, but guess what? It's also been uh, voted as the most, <clears throat> most ethical profession to be in. I hope we continue that fantastic reputation uh, with the public, right? They really do trust us. Um, the ANA also has a code uh, for nurses. And that is um, in the link there, or you can also read about it that's described thoroughly in your text, okay? So again, the ANA has um, the Code of Ethics for Nurses. Please take a look at that. <clears throat> Excuse me. The International Council of Nurses also has their own Code of Ethics as well, and this is just some of the highlights here, so read through those. Um, Here's the purpose of the code of ethics, right? So we have the succinct statements that helps um, negotiate the ethical standards of our profession, right? And what we provide in society, right? And um, we have, um, let's see. What's the problem here? Why is this not working? My apologies, I'm having trouble here with some of these uh, slides. All right, let's try this again. All right, so here's the International Councils of Nursing, also has their own co uh, code of ethics as well. And this is just some of the highlights. Now they're actually on there. Good grief, I apologize for that. Wes and I both don't change our recordings so that you can see we um, also have computer errors and issues. <laughs> so you can get a little bit of levity and laugh at us at our, uh, you know, we're a little bit, we're over 50, so that, that's, uh, we'll leave that right there. <laughs> All right, uh, here's Bill of Rights for registered nurses, right? So just take a look at this, right? Um, no need to memorize it, but just have an understanding of it. Again, uh, continued Bill of Rights. Here we have the um, seven basic tenets of Bill of Rights for registered nurses, right? So nursing established a bill of rights for themselves to aid in improving workplaces and ensuring the nurse's ability to provide safe quality patient care. This is intended to empower nurses um, to not accept anything lower in the workplace, right? So this gives us the latitude to say, no, this isn't acceptable for, acceptable to my patient's care and I'm not going to tolerate it. The ANA is working with legislature to make sure this is reality for all nurses across the country. Take a moment, read through these, pause the video. Do any of these sound unrealistic to you? I believe it should be something that is hung in every workplace. Moral distress occurs when you know the right thing to do, but either personal or institutional factors make it difficult to follow the correct course of action. Moral resilience is your ability to rise above the distressing situation and handle it well. You can support this practice by creating good working relationships with people you consult with, right? Not getting overwhelmed by the situations as they arise, keeping a good self-image, and accepting change as an inevitable thing that's going to occur every day of your life, right? Conscientious objection is when nurses have the ability to stand up and speak up and possibly refuse to participate in a situation that may be severely detrimental or a treatment or care that violates your personal ethic beliefs or standards, right? Moral resiliency and conscious objection, right? So look here, moral um, or ethical distress occurs again when you uh, know the right thing to do, uh, but either personally you can't do it or institutionally it's not um, able to do that, right? So 
Again, rise above moral distress. This slide shows a pathway developed by the Critical Care Nurses Association to help nurses take the right steps and ask the right questions when faced with ethical dilemmas or moral distress. It's the four A's of care, right? First, you need to ask yourself questions to help identify the nature of the problem. Then you need to affirm your distress and make a commitment to take care of yourself. Denying there is a problem can lead to physical and psychological ill being. Then assess the source and the severity of the problem. Finally, you wanna act on it to make the desired change. You will need to help solve your ethical distress, okay? So you're gonna literally act upon this, whatever that desired change is, um, to solve that ethical distress. Cultivating good relationships um, helps build resiliency. When you accept change, you know, change is part of living, um, you know, that is part of resiliency, right? Um, when you deal with a crisis rather than throwing your hands up in the air and saying this is just too tough i can't deal with this right that builds resiliency nurturing a positive viewpoint and really genuinely taking care of yourself right so that you're you know 100 percent, so you can take care of your patients right that builds resiliency and then obviously keeping things in perspective right don't be one of those people who like like wants to jump off the cliff every time some little thing happens right you really have to become able to deal with change continually happening um, as nurses we use the nursing process to resolve ethical conflicts first we assess the situation and gather all the data we diagnose and identify the problem then we plan by identifying possible solutions and weighing the consequences of those decisions then we implement or act upon the decision um, once again evaluating that decision and its outcome also consider what you have learned from this process so far um, ethic ethically relevant consideration so obviously we want to balance between what's beneficial as well as harmful to our patients we definitely have to disclose and inform consent and share all the information with our patients um, 100%, right? Um, norms of family life, relationships with their clinicians and the patients. We have to have professional integrity um, with our clinicians. Of course, our treatment has to be cost effective um, and allocated. It should be um, sufficiently and, and uh, fairly across the board, which we know it isn't, right? We already talked about that. Um, dealing with issues issues with culture and religious variation and then of course considerations of power right all of these are ethically relevant considerations you need to take into account when dealing with patient care this slide goes over potential situations that occur in healthcare that can have ethical problems right ethical problems can arise between patients and nurses nurses and physicians nurses and other nurses nurses and their employers and the list is long uh long 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 take a moment pause this also there's some examples in your textbook look at those those are pretty good um, it describes the situations that might put you in an ethical uh, problem where you need to pull in an outside source to help resolve them right um, outside of the immediate situation is what i meant um ethic committees are at many healthcare institutions these days um, actually at, they're at the majority if not all these committees are made up of interdisciplinary team members and administrative personnel these committees hear from all interested parties then using sound ethical decision making processes and follow ethical principles um, they discuss the issues and then they come to what they feel is the best decision right they do education they do case reviews they make policy they're available consultation just like we discussed in the other recording um, and sometimes they you know they have to you know go back and do a bunch of research before a conclusion can be made right it's not a quick process um, well it's quick in the sense that the decision is made quick you know um, rather quickly when it comes to uh, in the hospital environment, but please know there's research that's involved many times. And so it's not like it's an immediate decision right then, right? Here is lists of conflicts, conflicts of commitment potentiality, right? So um, again, 
you can't give what you don't have to your patients. So you got to take care of your own health needs, your own psychological, sociology, all of those needs before you can care for your patient, right? Um, we owe the same responsibility um, to treat ourselves as well as we treat others. Um, we tend to forget this as nurses, but, but we need to remember that, okay? One of nurses' biggest roles is being a patient advocate. We support our patients and their rights to make informed decisions. When they can't speak, we need to speak up for them, and we always put our patients first. Last slide, there are some concerns for nurses when, a, when being a patient's advocate, okay? We must represent our patients, but we also have to consider family or si significant others' concerns and wishes. Make sure to inform your patient's family with any information they need to have to make good decisions with the patient. Again, this is with the permission of the patient, right? We need to promote our patients making their own informed decisions. We cannot do that for them. So when they ask you for your opinion, and they will, you need to tell them that it's really their decision and just stick with um, you know the the pluses and the minuses for whatever that decision is we need to provide them with the adequate reliable information so that they don't look to us to make the decision for them any nurses who sees unfair care or practices needs to stand up and report it for the sake of our patients. It's not always safe to be a whistleblower, but when it comes to their needs of our patients and the safety of our, our patients, we have to speak up. That's our job. Nurses need to be more politically active to have our voices heard as a group. Um, we're not... Um, as organized as we can be, obviously, and it's something that we really need to strive for in the future. All right, this is the end of the chapter on morals, values, and advocacy.